Okay, everyone, we seem to be having a bit of a technical difficulty. This was the most amazing presentation that has ever existed. So you're going to have to use your imaginations that this was the best presentation ever. Now, it might pop up in any way, shape, and form. Now, if it does, that was a temporary glitch, and the presentation that might pop up might not actually be the real one that's in here. Otherwise, there might be a blue screen of death. Uh, but we will just get started, because there is a break after this, and I kind of need to go to the bathroom and get food, <laughs> and that is my only break. Um, so I will hand over to Susan very, very shortly. She is going to be talking about social media, the new court of public opinion, exploring the effects of social media on our unconscious bias. I have just spoken to her, because I've just been looking on Twitter, and she has been involved in pretty much every single event in Las Vegas over the past few days. Uh, she's been volunteering at B-Side, she was over at the Diana, Diana Initiative, she's been doing pretty much everything and this is the last thing on her agenda. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over. As I said, if her screen does pop up, just give her a quick nod or a wave to be like, yeah, slides are working. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'll hand over the head right now. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. So I know I'm between you guys on a break, so I will make this a short. Luckily, this is only a 20 minute presentation. Uh, like Jen just uh, said, I'm going to be speaking with you on social media and the new court of public opinion and how it affects our uh, unconscious bias. So I did have a wonderful disclaimer slide that said that um, any information delivered is just my own opinions and views and not my employers and everything I found uh, via OSINT and it is unclassified and I also try to stay as nonpartisan as possible. So there would have been uh, another slide of me and that's basically saying that I've had 14 years of experience in cybersecurity focused primarily in threat intelligence. I most recently was the cyber threat intelligence lead consultant at Booz Allen and um, I have founded CTI programs at a couple of different agencies uh, including U.S. Postal Service for the government of UAE and for the U.S. courts. And um, I am involved in a ton of different organizations. Uh, so one of them being I am the founder of B-Side Sacramento. And we are having our first event this year, which is going to be awesome. Uh, Women's Cyber Jitsu, Mental Health Hackers, um, EC Council, Seance Purple Team Summit. If you guys have questions about any of these, then just uh, let me know afterwards. We can have a talk and connect. So to get started on the uh, topic at hand, the court of public opinion uh, was originally something uh, that everybody's generally familiar with. It's innocent and proven guilty, which is technically our standard. Traditionally, a judge decides uh, what evidence to allow and jury appears to decide upon a verdict. And personal feelings, outside knowledge, pressures from friends and family expressly should not factor into this verdict at all. Legal cases are not meant to be argued outside of the courtroom um, or decided on gut or bias. But with the um, informal court of public opinion that has ar aroused, it's uh, operated with our it's, it's operated parallel to our legal system for decades. And this term is used to describe uh, how both sides of an issue using media in general and the influence of public opinion in turn, the juror, in turn uh, affects the jurors and uh, ultimately the verdict. So courts are well aware of this issue and jurors are uh, generally selected very carefully and sometimes even isolated to try to avoid the influence of public opinion on their verdict. So how has social media changed this? Uh, previously, the court of public opinion referred to using the news media to influence, which was standard radio and television, and those were the biggest concerns. The new court of public opinion is not just the news media, but also social media outlets such as Facebook and Twitter and Reddit, etc. 62% of U.S. adults uh, said that they get their news off of social media now versus watching the nightly news. Social media platforms such as Facebook have dramatically uh, given a different structure than previous uh, media technologies and the content can be relayed amongst users with no significant third party filtering, fact checking or editorial judgment which is our biggest concern. So there was a wonderful slide that showed a bunch of different statistics about the different platforms, uh, mainly Facebook, which is the biggest social media site around with more than 2.2 uh, billion people using it every month, and that's two-thirds of the world's population. There are more than 65 million businesses using Facebook pages and more than 6 million advertisers actively promoting their businesses on Facebook. There was a recent study which collected data about users in the U.S. mostly because that's where Facebook's biggest uh, lucrative market is. 
and it found an estimated 15 million fewer people are now using Facebook today uh, than they did in 2017, which is the biggest drop amongst, uh, seen amongst teen users and millennials. And that is uh, primarily because they are moving to a different platform. And if you want to guess what it is, it's Instagram. And that's ironic because Facebook owns Instagram. <laughs> Uh, there's also YouTube with 1.9 billion monthly average users, um, and that's obviously you guys know the video platform sharing where you can watch billions of hours of video every day. Twitter, which I think is the favorite among the hacks, hacker and infosec community, and it's a social media site for news, entertainment, sports, politics, everything. And uh, what makes t Twitter different from most other media sites, social media sites, is that there's a strong emphasis on real-time information, uh, things that are happening right now, and it's happening 280 characters at a time. Uh, there's also Reddit, which is known as the front page of the internet, and it's a platform where we can submit questions, links, images. There's the subreddits, which are dedicated forums, pretty much anything under the sun, and those are the deeper, more detailed areas of engagement. Um, it's anonymous, so there's free license uh, to be yourself, and it is very rarely policed. Each platform has its unique and distinctive qualities, and each play a role in telling a news story. So um, I was going to shift for a moment and talk about something a little bit more fictional. And there was, again, going to be an amazing slide about uh, Harry Potter. So hopefully uh, most of the people in this room have heard of Harry Potter or have at least read and watched the first book. So um, I'm going to have you recall the first Quidditch match where he was on his Nimbus 2000 and he started, it started acting very strange and was trying to knock him off. And meanwhile, Hermione uh, noticed Professor Snape was muttering uh, with his eyes fixed on the Gryffindor seeker. And being Hermione, she put two and two together. And she was well read about curses and every other type of subject for that matter. And she thought Snape was jinxing the broom and ran to Harry's rescue uh, with her fiery spell. So um, what Hermione did was distract the real cul culprit as she sneaked up on Snape. The troop came out that it was Professor Quirrell instead, um, and he admitted to Harry that he had jinxed the broom and claimed that he would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for those meddling counter curses. In other words, uh, Snape uh, tried to save Harry's life, and the only thanks he got was being set on fire. But why was it um, automatically an assumption that Snape was uh, doing something uh, malicious towards Harry. And it's just because of his character. He was the Hogwarts potion master, he was the head of the Slytherin house, and a former Death Eater. And uh, he seemed to hold a grudge against Harry. But it was really Professor Quirrell, and we didn't suspect him because he came across as this feeble, timid, and full of nerves kind of guy. Um, he stuttered and stammered his way through conversations, and his n nerves were so pronounced that it was rumored his turban was stuffed full of garlic to ward off vampires. Uh, and why, why did this happen? Like, why did this occur? Why did nobody think it was him? And in one word, it was bias. So. Uh, to shift back to the nonfiction, to everyday life. And every day we see images of the, from the media to provoke reactions, uh, but we don't usually know the full story uh, coming before coming to those conclusions. It can easily be a case of he said or she said, and uh, with the truth being out there and we don't really know what to believe, it, it's on us to do the research and try to find both sides of the story and make an educated uh, opinion about it at that point in time. How you perceive things, your uh, general outlook basically determines your actions. Um, a perspective distorted by biases cannot lead to sound decision making. And this is where um, cyber comes in. But first, a, a real world example that happened. Uh, it was from earlier this year, in April of this year, there was a Monday afternoon and the police in Bourbonsville, West Virginia, had reported on Facebook that a woman called 911 and told dispatchers that a strange man had tried to grab her five-year-old daughter while at the local shopping mall. The woman told them that she, was, she had scared the stranger away by pulling uh, out her gun and when the officers showed up on the scene a short time later, they spotted a man uh, in the food court that fit, that fit this description and um, he was prominently arrested then. 
hundreds of people reacted to the post on Facebook that the police posted and praised the young mother's vigilance and quick thinking, warning others to be on the lookout for what would be human traffickers at the West Virginia Mall. But less than 24 hours later, uh, Mohammed Zayen, 54, he was from Alexandria, Egypt, was booked into jail on a felony attempted abduction charge, and the panic-inducing story started falling apart. Court officers, uh, or I'm sorry, the officers returned to the mall Tuesday morning and found no witnesses that were able to collaborate with her account of what happened. She then admitted that uh, the more she thought about it, she realized that it might have just been a cultural misunderstanding and the suspect would have just been probably patting her daughter on the head and smiling versus trying to abduct her. By Thursday, the prosecutors had dropped all charges against Cyan and the engineer, he was an engineer working on a contract job there, and he had actually just gone to Old Navy to pick up some clothes for his own uh, five-year-old daughter. So ultimately, they found no evidence, and he wasn't even near the girl at the time. And so officials often speculate that the tales about attempted abdu uh, child abductions on social media uh, may be to blame, which have the tendency of going viral despite the lack of evidence behind them. So that was just one example in a local news media. I did have a picture of the, and hopefully you guys have seen this picture, but the uh, MAGA kid, the Nick Sandman, where he's faced with the uh, uh, Native American uh, beating the drum and he has this very smug expression on his face. So if you had seen the picture, <laughs> um, it, was, it was to see that uh, initial reaction that everybody had to it. This. Um, this massive demonization that happened of the MAGA kid uh, for the crime of smirking, essentially. And it turned out later that the students who had arrived in D.C. to participate in the March for Life had been waiting for the bus, and they were being verbally attacked by a whole other set of uh, group of people. And uh, while they were being, they were, that group of people were harassing the students, um, calling them white crackers, incest children, and an F word that I refuse to repeat, um, the Covington students then responded in turn and tried to drown out the uh, hecklers uh, with school chants of Cub Cath is the best. That's when the uh, Phillips, the Native American man, considered that things were getting too ugly and decided to intervene. And he led his Indigenous Peoples March, which was, he was participating in at the same time, uh, to divide the students and the other group while, standing, um, while singing a tribal song and beating on his drum. And at some point in time, he faced Nick Sandman, and this picture was taken. And it was all over the news, and everybody had these incredible reactions, especially all over Twitter. And uh, there were meltdowns over his expression, claiming that it represented bigotry and white privilege. And uh, there were calls for his expulsion, and uh, planned on killing any future career that he might have uh, aspired to. Upon some reflection of this event, some pointed out the startling parallels uh, to George Orwell's 1984, which said citizens were persecuted for committing a uh, quote-unquote face crime. Even after the video footage proved that the Native American, uh, Nathan Phillips, walked straight into the middle of the group of Covington High School students and was not mobbed by them, as media had claimed, Sandman had still been crucified for smirking during the encounter. So. Uh, I would have been remiss to, if I hadn't mentioned the elections, especially since we are coming up on election season. And uh, again, uh, my slides would have um, shown how uh, in the 2016 elections with Clinton uh, versus Trump, um, there was a lot of the uh, fake news that was coming out. And many people uh, would see fake news reports and believe them. The most discussed uh, uh, fake news stories were usually in favor of Donald Trump over, over Hillary Clinton. And a number of commentators have suggested that Trump would not have been elected president if there hadn't been the influence of fake news. And uh, one of these stories that I found most intriguing was uh, Pizzagate. And I don't know if you uh, guys heard about this one. But basically, it stemmed from a WikiLeaks re release a WikiLeaks release, that's hard to say, of John Podesta's emails, um, which were wildly misinterpreted, where Edgar Welch drove from his hometown in Salisbury, North Carolina, uh, to Comic Ping Pong in a northern part of Washington, D.C. And he was armed with three guns, and he had the plan to free the children that were being held in the basement in a child abuse scheme led by Hillary Clinton. 
there was uh, no basement at Comic Ping Pong, and there were no children to free, and all he ended up being successful in was frightening employees and patrons who ran in a panic, obviously, and uh, ruining the owner's reputation, and his business was tainted by the conspiracy. So this uh, keys into fear-mongering, which is the act of deliberately arousing public fear or alarm for a particular issue. Social media's influence on our thoughts uh, can key into this term of fear-mongering. So how do we develop the discernment to understand what is actually true? Discernment is an inner knowledge, knowing sourced from genuine truth, while judgment is sourced in fear. Discernment is a spark of intuitive knowledge, an inner voice of principle, and certainly one that aligns uh, with our path, purpose, and inspiration. Judgment is about control and uh, uses fear and manipulation uh, as a means to gain it. So what is the psychology behind this? What is the sci scientific study of, of mind and behavior that, that um, is behind all of this? So one thing about social media is that we're able to curate our community and uh, we are able to reinforce our beliefs then because we usually select who we follow and who we friend and who we connect with. And so how we get to select our social media community and curate our own news feeds, usually filled with those with similar outlooks, just uh, possibly could encourage and solidify our own personal views. So we just have to be cognizant of the fact that we might not be seeing both sides of the story. So I had pointed out three of my favorite bias, biases that uh, um, I found uh, I came into contact with the most. The first one being confirmation bias, and that's one of the most common. It's the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms one's pre-existing beliefs or hypothesis. Uh, this is a bias we seek uh, to interpret new information as a way to confirm our current views, as well as discounting data or views that contradict or um, perhaps an alternative to our views. We see this in information security when executives believe that technology can provide their most, uh, the most of their defenses and they look at successes uh, these devices have, but perhaps ignore the shortcomings and therefore inflate the real effectiveness of these tools. So the other one that I was going to uh, mention is the Dunning-Kruger effect, and uh, that is coming from perhaps overconfidence. So when we're doing analysis, it's something that we have to be very, very careful of. Dunning-Kruger is basically where, um, and this comes in a little bit with fake news too, where you learn a little bit of something and you have this very high overinflative sense of, I know everything about it, I am the master, I am the expert. And being in cybersecurity, we hear that term a lot, I'm, I'm the expert. Luckily, we have a lot of people who will challenge us, and that's great um, if, if we do that, uh, because we always can learn more. Then there's that moment where the curve will dip, and again, you would have seen a curve, uh, where the curve will dip and you realize you probably don't know as much as you thought you did, and then uh, you go and research and learn some more, and then you equalize that curve. So that's Dunning-Kruger. And then we had the halo and horn effect, which is a tendency to allow one's judgment of another person, especially in a job interview, to be duly influenced by unfavorable, meaning the horn, or the favorable halo, first impression based on somebody's appearances, maybe. Uh, there are several, uh, their um, halo horn effect is a cognitive bias that causes the interview to unfairly balance, uh, balance one trait, either good or bad, causing this to overshadow the other traits and not look at the whole person, perhaps. And this is just in the interview uh, case. Uh, the mirror because um, you are like me and I am like you, um, or the opposite effect, I don't like you uh, because you are not like me, uh, takes place uh, with the halo horn effect as well. Then there would have been a very big eyesore of every single cognitive bias in one infograph, and there are just dozens upon dozens that um, you would have seen. And I was going to point out just a few that I have seen and, and perhaps give real-world real world examples of um, how we might see them in our security operations. So the first one being anchoring bias. Uh, when you first buy your computer, you, especially like back in the day, you were told or found that you needed an antivirus. And 10 or 20 years later, you probably still believe that antivirus is the only solution, maybe not the people in this room, um, to keep your computer safe. Um, but this is where anchoring bias uh, would be in action. It's relying too much on uh, that first piece of information 
and how it'll affect you going forward. I think I'm done. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm getting away from the back of the room, but uh, there was only one more slide and it was just basically a challenge to you guys. Um, make sure that your decisions are not based on bias. Uh, develop that self-awareness and monitor our, um, your own self-discernment. Uh, personal responsibility for your actions and judgments and challenge and counteract biases if you see them in your security operations center. So there are dangers of one-sided stories. Just be very aware of that. Again, how you perceive your outlook determines your actions. A perspective uh, can be distorted by biases and it is not sound decision making then. So I apologize for the slides and the technical difficulties. I will not stand between you and a break again. Uh, and thank you for coming to my TED talk.